Well, welcome again to the virtual dimension of the teaching ministry here at Living Springs Fellowship. Uh, we're going to be actually be getting into the second part of our two-part series from 2 Corinthians, starting in chapter 4, verse 7, and working on through the first part of chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, why don't you open there along with me, okay, today? 2 Corinthians, we're going to start in chapter 4, okay? Now, it's interesting, you know, I find that Christians in America today, we're all into, you need Jesus, God will forgive your sins, you need to be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, in unity and fellowship with other believers in Christ, yeah, the church, and don't get me wrong, I mean, all those things are essential to what it is to be a Christian. But unfortunately, because we're so into and focused on the here and now, we're totally missing out on and therefore neglecting the very essence of the life and witness which the first apostles and the early church so effectively and powerfully lived, whereby they presented their world with a truly credible living and spirit-empowered testimony for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, there's an underlying purpose for all that essential stuff, bringing us now to what the true and biblical faith, the basis upon which all those essentials that we just talked about is all about. Hebrews 11 verse 1 informs us of the fact that it says faith it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I mean, obviously, God's word clearly isn't talking about the here and now, is it? Rather, it's talking about faith that is based in and focused on that which is beyond the here and now, the ultimate and forever purpose and promise of God for those who choose to turn from themselves and all else to commit their lives their hope and destiny to Jesus instead. The fact that God has really, you know, since the beginning been in the business of redeeming a people out from among this present world unto himself to inherit a life and kingdom that is perfect in all that he has always and lovingly purposed for us to share together in fellowship with him forever, which happens to be the whole purpose and the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The neglect of which, as we've tended to focus on the here and now, really has. It's robbed the testimony and the witness of Christians in America today of the very substance and essence of the gospel that we are seeking to proclaim to a lost and a dying world. Even in this season, when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the point being, the atonement, the seal of God's spirit, and everything else God has graciously provided for those who are his in Jesus Christ, yes, in the here and now, it's all supposed to bear testimony to not just what God has for us in the here and now, but ultimately, that glorious eternal destiny for which you and I have been graciously redeemed out from among this present world to inherit in Christ forever, which totally, really, I find, changes everything about how and for what you and I, as the heirs of that glorious eternal destiny, instead live our lives for, in testimony to the gospel of Christ before this present venerable sin-corrupted world. It's what I refer to as living the resurrection perspective which is basically what the text that we were into last week and, and again this week is all about. That whole life perspective that was so proud, profoundly evident even in the lives of those who truly walked with God in the Old Testament regarding whom Hebrews 11 verses 13 through 16 informs you and I that these all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that 
they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they'd called to mind that country from which they had come or been redeemed out of, they would have had opportunity to return. But now, we're told, they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Listen, you really want to live the spirit-filled and empowered life that God has called and graciously provided for us to live before this world in this our appointed place and time? Well, then you and I are going to have to start seeing things so as to live our lives daily from a whole new resurrection perspective on reality. So with that, open your Bibles with me again once again this week, should I say, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to begin here today in verse 7, where Paul reveals a truth that I think contradicts so much of what we've come to believe and put into practice in serving for the testimony of Christ today. He writes, he says, but we have, in other words, possess this treasure, referring to the light of the knowledge of the glory of God revealed to mankind in the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, you see it there in the previous verse, verse 6, where it says, for it is the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge or the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have this treasure, he says, in earthen vessels. And he's talking about these weak and frail earthly temporal bodies that you and I currently inhabit. Bodies that, well, through the course of our lives here in this world, constantly subject all of us to stuff like pain, suffering, temptation, sickness, and yes, uh, persecution, failure, and even death. Inconvenient realities that I refer to as the human dimension of living to serve for the testimony of Christ, which happens to be really God's calling and purpose for our lives. And the reason for that, you ask? <laughs> Well, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? I mean, some might label this as counterproductive. I mean, I'm thinking, why would God place such an incomprehensible treasure in something or, or someone like us? Well, for the answer, that when you take into account the whole purpose behind all of it, <laughs> actually makes a whole lot of sense testifying to the infinite perfection of the wisdom of God in contrast to the foolishness of our own. And you see it here. For Paul goes on to say that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. I mean, yeah, basically this is God's chosen modus operandi, if you will. Listen. When it's the grace and the power of God being poured through our lives to others, when it's truly the grace and the power of God being poured through our lives to others, nobody's going to be impressed with and drawn to us by the illusion that we're some kind of awesome, powerful, or anointed man or woman of God. No. The thing they're going to come away with is the realization that the power that's working through us isn't of us. Rather, it testifies to how faithful, how loving, gracious, and merciful God is, affirming really the truth of Jesus' person and redeeming sacrifice in their behalf is evidenced by his resurrection life, by his spirit being selflessly allowed to lead and work in and through us through these frail, earthly, temporal bodies. The point being, you and I, serving as the representatives of Jesus Christ, like Jesus who served others out of a common earthly body like ours, as the prophet foretold that he would, 
in Isaiah 53, verse 2, said, For he, Jesus, shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Well, same for us. We're not supposed to be the ones that others are impressed with. Really, I think, goes to what Jesus told the religious big shots of his day. In John chapter 7, verse 18, when he said, He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. Following which, he said this to his own disciples in John chapter 14, verse 13. As they were learning to serve alongside of him, he said, And whatever you ask in my name, in other words, for my sake, that I will do, and listen to what Jesus said next, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Offering, I think, you and I now some pretty clear and compelling evidence that nothing Jesus said or did the first time he came was ever about himself. And yet, look at the love, the light, and the power of God that broke through into the darkness of the sin-corrupted world through him as a result. So yeah, we can make a name for ourselves, our church, our ministries. <laughs> but the thing is, however, forget about ever bearing testimony to the light of the glory of God revealed to mankind in the person and the life of Jesus Christ. Out of the treasure of divine grace and power, the likes of which Paul is talking about here in these verses. You see, this is a problem I find that we totally create for ourselves when we make our service for the testimony of Christ so much about our abilities, accomplishments, and performance. Because face it, stuff like human weakness, struggles, pain, suffering, and even failure, the human dimension of serving for the testimony of Christ will invariably undermine our efforts in serving others to the point that we're either deceiving ourselves as well as the people. We're trying in our own strength and abilities and resources to serve, leading them to think that we're something more than what we are. Or more often than not, what ends up happening is we lose heart and we give up. But on the other hand, none of this stuff I refer to as the human dimension of serving or living to serve for the testimony of Christ, really, it didn't have any real detrimental effect. Not when it came to the lives and the testimony of those early apostles. I mean, you heard it from Paul himself where he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verses 8 through 10. He said, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also might be manifested in our own body. But again, you see, that's always been God's M.O. It's how he's always purposed to manifest the resurrection life and the testimony of Jesus in and through the likes of such ordinary, weak, frail, and flawed earthen vessels as you and I. So that what others experience and behold is the grace, the love, the mercy, and the power of God in Christ instead of us. So, all right. How did Paul and the others come to deal with then the reality of the inconvenience? of the human nature, or the human dimension, should I say, of, of serving for the testimony of Christ. It's an example, really, that the rest of us can learn from and, and then put to practice in our own lives, which is basically, I think, what this text that we're in here today is all about. Well, you know, maybe you remember what Jesus told his followers in John 16, 33. He basically laid it out for us in the clearest possible terms. He didn't tell us that we wouldn't have tribulation, nor did Jesus say that we could, maybe, or might have tribulation. He made it clear. He said, we will have tribulation. It's a virtual certainty. 
that's unavoidably inherent in the human dimension of serving for his testimony. But the thing is, however, there's a promise, an objective to focus on yet ahead, a wonderful, perfect, eternal, and eventual certainty to hope in and live for. As Jesus went on to say, he said, but be of good cheer. In other words, don't let that stuff take you down. He said, because I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Well, well, what's that supposed to mean? Well, we don't want to stop with chapter 16. I mean, it seems rather clear if you read on just a little further into John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. Jesus went on and said, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, I think it's obvious at that point that Jesus' mission, the first time he came to provide atonement for our sins, through his selfless suffering, atoning death on the cross, was about to be finished and completed. And I think we all know what followed after that, don't we? His victorious resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 declares that the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. The last enemy. It's true. All the present pressing issues, challenges, troubles, and suffering inherent in the human dimension of serving for the testimony of Christ aside, there still looms yet ahead of all of us the inevitable specter of death. That final, ultimate, <laughs> inconvenient reality associated with the human dimension of serving for the testimony of Christ. And face it, everybody's going to have to deal with that sooner or later. Unless the rapture happens first. So, I don't know, maybe you're thinking like, why are we even doing this? Serving for the testimony of Christ before this present sin-corrupted world anyway. Well... Again, it all goes to what Jesus told us. He said, in the world, you, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Yeah, we're talking about living in the resurrection perspective. Just check out what Jesus actually accomplished through his victorious resurrection from the dead. We're told in Hebrews 2, verses 14 through 15, it says, inasmuch as the children... and that would be you and I, mere humanity, have partaken of flesh and blood. In other words, being constrained within and troubled because of these frail, temporal, earthly, mortal bodies we currently inhabit. It says he, Jesus, himself likewise shared in the same. He took upon himself a body like our own. So tells us that through death, yeah, Jesus' death on the cross, I mean, because face it, he had to first die in order to be resurrected, right? It says he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. In other words, you know, not even the specter of death stands now to oppose you and I as, as we live to serve for the testimony of Christ to our world. And the apostles knew this as they were all eyewitnesses to Jesus' atoning death, burial, and victorious resurrection from the dead. And consequently, they had no problem whatsoever accepting and dealing with the human dimension of living to serve for the testimony of Christ because they understood as a result of what God was actually accomplishing through their own human weakness and struggles and eventual death in this present life, 
they'd seen it already played out in Jesus, atoning death and victorious resurrection. And now, well, it was their turn. And Paul essentially, I think, tells it like it is there in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 11. Where he says, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. That's right. People are going to see the resurrection life of Jesus as we lay down our lives in faith, yielding these frail, temporal human bodies we currently inhabit for the sake of his resurrection, life, love, and testimony to be manifested to the world in and through us. Yeah, even in and through the things we have to deal with in this life. And as I said last week, <laughs> that's basically how it works. Living to serve for the testimony of Jesus to our spouse, our children, one another, and to the world around us. And sharing in that whole, really, faith and eternal focus together is essentially what our whole life and testimony as a church for Jesus is supposed to be all about in the here and now. It's supposed to be about forever. And you see it here in 2 Corinthians 4.13. He said, Paul writes, he says, since we have the same spirit of faith, According to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. He said, we also believe and therefore we speak. So yeah, it's not supposed to only involve Paul and the other apostles whom Jesus initially commissioned and sent out. No, we're talking all of us together who believe. Who believe. That word belief is translated from the Greek word pisteo meaning to be thoroughly, absolutely, and incontrovertibly convinced that the something is true. And you see that fact highlighted in the very next verse. Verse 14, check it out. Paul says, knowing this, knowing this to be true, no question about it, he goes on to say that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up and present us with you. Suddenly, that totally and forever does. It changes everything, particularly where all these inconvenient realities of the human dimension of serving for the testimony of Jesus Christ are concerned. Look at verse 16. He goes on, he says, Therefore, therefore in spite of all of these issues associated with the human dimension, Paul explains, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, because face it, unless I said the rapture happens first, we all know it's inevitable that at some point, all of us are going to die and pass on. And we'll get to that whole business in just a bit. Paul says, yet the inward man, referring to our spirit, brought to life as a result of God's spirit who lives within us, who manifests the knowledge and the glory of God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ through us, Paul declares here, he said, is being renewed day by day. Yeah, it's the unending, boundless grace of God's provision being constantly poured into our lives all the while as we allow it to be poured out to others. And I'm talking about the life, the love, and the power of the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So that now, again, when it comes to all those issues associated with the human dimension of serving for the testimony of Jesus Christ, things like temptation, challenges, opposition, persecution, pain, weakness, suffering, sickness, and even death, life in this world takes on a whole new meaning and purpose when processed from a whole new eternal and perfect perspective on life and reality. The resurrection perspective. Making really the human dimension of serving for the testimony of Christ. No longer an issue of sheer futility, frustration and death. But instead about a glorious eternal purpose. Which the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ made possible for the likes of you and I. 
causing Paul to declare further in 2 Corinthians 4.17. He said, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, I mean, yeah, when viewed from an eternal resurrection perspective, as opposed to that old present here now perspective that really does totally frustrate those who don't know what Paul and the rest of us know. Paul says that light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us who have this resurrection perspective is working for us instead of against us, who know the truth of what Jesus has already accomplished for you and I through his atoning death and victorious resurrection, Paul says, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He's talking about a glory that will and forever far surpass any and all the tri trials, tribulation, and suffering inherent in the human dimension. But only... But only as Paul and the others learned, he says in verse 18, you see it there, while we do not look at the things which are seen. That's not the focus. That's not the perspective. But he says, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And again, well, here's where that whole business of faith comes into play in the lives of those who believe. As Jesus assured Martha when her brother Lazarus passed away, he said this to her in John 11, 25, and 26. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So, do you believe this? Well, Paul did. And look what he knew and was assured of as a result, enabling he and the other apostles not only to accept, but successfully face and deal with the challenges, struggles, temptations, suffering, and opposition that is inherent in the human dimension of serving for the testimony of Christ. So you ready for this? Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Here's what faith does for us. He says, for we know. That's right. He said, we know. It's kind of nice to have that, uh, what do you call it, that heavenly eternal intelligence. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, and he's referring to his earthly bodies that we all inhabit presently, he said, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Yeah, Paul knew because he'd witnessed it personally in Jesus' atoning death and subsequent victorious resurrection from the dead. And, and we should know it too on account of his and the other apostles' eyewitness account that's faithfully recorded for us here in the Word of God. That at the moment of physical death, when our eternal spirit and soul leaves these frail, weak, and corruptible earthly bodies behind to be with the Lord in heaven, whereupon they'll eventually break down by one means or another, and so as to return to the earth as the individual elements of which they've been consisted. It sets you and I up as a result now to receive and put on our incorruptible physical heavenly bodies much like Jesus' physical resurrection body he was clothed with, with when he was raised from the dead. And we talked about that last week. Which for you and I as the church is going to happen at the appointed time of the rapture. Described for us in 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Which, face it, gives each of us who are truly in Christ Jesus, yeah, a, a whole new perspective from which to face and deal with the human dimension of serving for the testimony of Christ in the here and now. Check it out. Look at verses 2 through 5. Paul writes, 
For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. For we are in this tent right now, this body, earthly body. He said, groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. I mean, you know, people that don't have this hope... Faced with the issues and the struggles of life, sometimes they just say, hey, give it up, man. I just, I just want to die. I'll leave this body behind. It's, just be, well, you know, junk it. And I get that. But for those who have this hope and who know, who know the destiny that God has set before us as a result of the atoning death and the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, we, know, we, we, we don't just want to leave these bodies behind. No, we look forward to be clothed with a new heavenly resurrection body. So there you have it. I mean, and he goes on to say, Now he was prepared us for this very thing as God. And that is, he's prepared us. He's prepared us through the testimony of the apostles. He's prepared us in another incredible way. We're going to see that in just a minute. He said, and here it is, who also has given us the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee. I mean, that's right, the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead is given to and dwell the hearts and lives of those who are truly born of the Spirit, children of God in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit, who is God's personal guarantee that this glorious eternal destiny that is our inheritance in Christ is totally going to happen. Which in turn, there you have it, gives rise, we see with Paul, to an unshakable confidence in the future, in the eternal, that nothing we face in this life will ever be able to break. I mean, check it out. You see it in verses 6 through 8 here. Paul writes, so we are always confident. We're always confident. Regardless of what life throws at us, whatever we have to deal with in the human dimension of serving for the testimony of Christ, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body right now, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, he said, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. So that's what they are looking for and looking forward to. And that, my beloved, is the resurrection perspective. That's what the world really needs to see in us as you and I live for the testimony of Christ. Thereby providing irrefutable testimony to the fact that the gospel we seek to live and proclaim truly is the real deal. As Philippians 3, verses 20 through 21, closes us out this morning with this. It says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. 